Thing to three households in the run-up to Christmas. So we're asking, should the rest of the UK follow Scotland with their COVID restrictions? First, it's the news with Tamsin Roberts. Gloria, thank you. This is your news at two o'clock. The Prime Minister has defended last night's vote on COVID measures brought before Parliament, saying it was won with Conservative support. More than 100 Tory MPs voted against the government's plans for COVID passes. However, the legislation still passed with support from Labour. At Prime Minister's questions, the leader of the opposition, Sir Keir Starmer, said the country was burdened with the worst Prime Minister at the worst possible time. So will the Prime Minister take time this Christmas to look in the mirror and ask himself whether he has the trust and authority to lead this country? Mr Speaker, uh, thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Let, 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 we, we won that uh, vote last night with Conservative votes, as I, as I told the House. I respect the feelings and the, I respect the anxieties uh, that colleagues have about. Of course, I do. I respect and understand the anxieties, the legitimate anxieties that colleagues have about uh, restrictions on their liberty. But I believe, uh, and on the liberty of, the, of people. But I believe that the approach that we're taking is balanced and proportionate and right for this country. For the third day, lateral flow tests are unavailable to order on the UK government website. Instead, it advises people to collect them from pharmacies or collection points. Meanwhile, all over 18s are now able to book their booster jab if their second vaccine was three months ago. While Boris Johnson is expected to make a statement at 5pm today, we'll bring you that here on GB News when it happens. The cost of living has surged this month as inflation reached its highest level in a decade. The consumer price index is up to 5.1% this month, up from 4.2% in October, according to the Office for National Statistics. The increase was led by a steep rise in fuel prices, as well as clothing, food and second-hand cars. So it is high. And again, if you look at what's happening with inf uh, wages, which you published yesterday, although in October wages were uh, increasing above the rate of inflation by about 1.7 per cent, having higher inflation, if all things being equal, it may be that actually wages are going to start going either at or to a slightly below inflation over the next few months. The woman who killed 16-month-old star Hobson will be sentenced imminently. 28-year-old Savannah Brockhill was branded pure evil by Star's family after she was found guilty of murdering the toddler. Star endured months of assault and psychological harm before suffering catastrophic injuries in her home in West Yorkshire. Her mother and Brockhill's former partner, 20-year-old Frankie Smith, were cleared of murder but convicted of causing or allowing the youngster's death. One person has died and a number of others are unaccounted for after a fire at a property in Reading last night. A 31-year-old man has been arrested on suspicion of murder and arson. Police and fire crews were called to a large blaze in Grovelands Road. One resident said he had a miracle escape by jumping from the third floor of the burning building. A campaigner has lost a challenge against the government over gender-neutral passports. Christy Ellen Kane pushed for more than 25 years to achieve legal and social recognition for non-gendered identity in a case that has reached the highest court in the land. However, the Supreme Court found that UK law doesn't recognise a non-gendered category of individual and allowing ex-passports would cause legal issues in confirming an individual's identity. They unanimously denied the case. Seven times Formula One world champion Lewis Hamilton has been knighted by the Prince of Wales today for his services to motorsports. It's just days after the British sports star controversially lost out on a record eighth F1 world title. The 36-year-old attended the investiture at Windsor Castle. Those are the top stories. I'll bring you the latest headlines in half an hour. Now back to Gloria and Liam. Coming up today on De Piero and Halligan. Scotland's First Minister Nicola Sturgeon says people should limit their social mixing to three households in the run-up to Christmas to try and slow the spread of the Omicron variant. So today we're asking, should the rest of the UK follow Scotland with their Covid restrictions and advice? Also ahead of a hugely important by-election for the Conservatives tomorrow and hours after Boris Johnson's biggest Tory rebellion to date, the Prime Minister at crisis point. It's not just our guests we want to hear from, though there'll be plenty of those. Join us with your view, GB Views at gbnews.uk or tweet us at gbnews.
despite that huge number of Conservative MPs voting against the government's plans to introduce COVID passes in England. There were around 100 rebels. The measure went through in the House of Commons last night. It's one of a number of new restrictions being implemented in England, including face masks indoors and making vaccines compulsory for NHS workers in England. But just hours before in Scotland, First Minister Nicola Sturgeon asked people to limit socialising to three households in the run-up to Christmas to try to slow the spread of the Omicron variant. Shops and hospitality venues will also be told to bring back social distancing and screens, the First Minister explained yesterday. So today we're asking, should the rest of the UK follow Scotland's COVID advice or would that be an overreaction? We're delighted to be joined now by the Liberal Democrat Treasury spokesperson and MP for Edinburgh West, Christine Jardine. Christine, obviously Hello. you go back and forth between London and Edinburgh. Yeah. What differences do you notice when you get off the train? Um, well, the big difference I notice is that we have all been wearing masks for a long time. Uh, last weekend, um, I didn't uh, get home. I had to stay in London because I had been pinged on Thursday. And I have to admit that I followed the Scottish rules rather than the, the English rules. Um, on Friday, I went, it, was, um, it was overnight Thursday night. So on Friday morning, I went back to my flat and just stayed there for the weekend, did my test Friday morning, back to the flat, stayed there, self-isolated, which wasn't that I was told that I don't have to self-isolate in England at that time. So in some ways, it, it's always been clearer about the need to isolate um, when you have a positive test. But I think sometimes we're, we're in danger in, in, uh, down here of thinking that we've got everything right in Scotland. Actually, you know, we haven't. There's a lot of flaws. There's a lot of confusion about what it is the Scottish government is actually doing. Um, for example, in the run-up to Christmas, I can have both of my sisters in my house, but not um, my, you know, a, a fourth, if you like, household. I can, however, go to a concert with 400 people. Now, that to me doesn't make sense. Um, I'm being asked not to have a Christmas party. I've cancelled my Christmas party, but I could still go to that same place for dinner with you know, several friends, and um, there's no limit on that. So there's a vast inconsistency in what Nicola is saying. We've got shortages of um, lateral flow tests, and we've also have lateral flow tests. So please don't go thinking that everything in Scotland is perfect. There are some things that we've got right, some things that are far from right. So I think we need to be careful in thinking that, you know, everything that Nicola says is wonderful and our garden in Scotland is rosy. We have, we have issues as well. As somebody who supports... Uh... Uh, Scotland staying in the UK, uh, Christine, isn't there a danger that these different rules for England, Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland, to a lot of the public, look, there's no borders between our the various constituent parts of the UK. People can come and go as they please. Given that fact, the differing rules, they, it looks to many people like just national leaders playing politics. Wouldn't it be better if we had one overall policy for the UK as a whole? I think there is a huge danger in leaders playing politics with this. For example, Nicola said during the, the Scottish election that recovery would come first. And of course, we wouldn't be talking about independence again until you know after COVID-19. And then she says yesterday she doesn't want to make political points and then immediately goes on television in Scotland to say, well, of course, the Scottish, the UK government gave us more money. The UK government has given Scotland record amounts of, of money over the past few months. And, you know, I'll be the first to, to say that, you know, the furlough scheme and um, the Barnet consequentials and everything that Scotland has had over the past 18 months have made a massive difference to how we have been able to cope in Scotland with COVID-19. And I think for any political leader, any politician, myself included, to blatantly try and point score over this is just unacceptable. It's a national emergency. It's a national crisis. We should be pulling together rather than looking for ways that we can just criticise one another and pass the buck for the, the fact that things like business support are not being done. Uh, Christian, the Prime Minister has a press conference at five o'clock today. Would you like him to announce further restrictions? Um, what I think is unacceptable is that the Prime Minister was in the House less than an hour, and speaking to the comments, less than an hour before they announced 
the press conference. Um, I have no idea what the, the Prime Minister is going to announce today, but what we need is some clarity. What we need is some leadership and what we need is support from business. At the moment, we've, we've got record inflation for the past 10 years, 5.1% this morning. Uh, families are already facing a cost of living crisis and you know, squeeze on their budgets because of you know, the rapid increase in energy prices. What I want to see this government do is set out clearly what they're going to do next, set out clearly how they're going to help families faced with a tax hike next year, and clearly how they are going to help the very many people in this country who are going to struggle and whose livelihoods are going to be threatened by the lack of support for business. Christine Jardine, MP for Edinburgh West and Lib Dem Treasury Spokesman, thanks a lot for joining us here on Gloria and Liam. We're also joined by SNP councillor Peter Craig from South Lanarkshire Councillor. Peter, welcome to the show. The First Minister only advised Scots to limit social contacts. Should you have gone further? No, I, I think uh, it's the responsibility of everyone uh, to take on the, the role of protector. Uh, it's not about demanding that people do things. It's about each person having a social responsibility to protect everybody else. Uh, so that, that is definitely the way we should be going. Peter, the First Minister also in that same statement seemed to complain that she would go further and provide more business support if only the Westminster government would give Scotland more money. Scotland already receives far more per head from the UK's budget than people in England or in Wales by a considerable margin. How much money will ever be enough? Well, I would take issue with the point that you're saying that uh, they're given, Scotland's been given money. Scotland's not been given money. Uh, you tend to indicate that that money's not going to be paid back. It is going to be paid back and it's going to be paid back by the, the Scottish taxpayer. What we are interested in is making sure that the businesses who are going to be hugely affected by this have some uh, have some compensation uh, for trying to do their bit uh, in keeping this virus at bay. Because the last thing we want to do is have a situation where the, uh, the, the country has to go back into lockdown and businesses have to shut. So uh, protecting those businesses is absolutely the right thing to do. Yesterday, eight members of Parliament at the last count tested positive for COVID. Many are asking, why are they not taking part remotely? Can you tell us what's happening at council level there? Are you still having face-to-face -face meetings? No, we haven't had any face-to-face -face meetings for well over a year now. Uh, we do everything through, uh, through teams. Uh, and everybody's now very used to working with uh, electronic media. And it, it helps in lots of other ways as well. But uh, the, the, our, uh, all our meetings for the past uh, 14 months uh, have been held through Teams. Peter, just go, go back to the point before, because a lot of people email us about this on the show. So I've got the numbers here, and I just did a sum while you were talking. In 2019-20, the UK government, uh, government spending was 11 £1,565 in Scotland and £9,604 in England. So, by my calculation, Scotland is getting 20.4% more government spending per head than in England. And Nicola Sturgeon says it isn't enough. How much would be enough? 25% more than England? 30? 50? No, I'm, I think it's a false premise that you're, you're making that argument on. Uh, as far as uh, Scotland's concerned, it's a, a much more rural uh, constituency, a much more rural country uh, with more difficulty in travelling round about. So uh, nobody's asking uh, for, for more money uh, to be given to Scotland. What we're asking for uh, is uh, that we, we have a, a fair settlement in order to control this virus at the moment. Uh, and that's the priority. That's what we have to concentrate on, is being able to uh, keep down the numbers of this virus, keep people out of hospitals uh, and keep businesses open. 
Peter Craig, SNP member of South Council, Lanarkshire Council. Thanks a lot for joining us here Thank on you. GB News. Today we're asking, should the rest of the UK follow Scotland's COVID advice? We want to hear from you. <laughs> Email GBviews at GBnews.uk or tweet us at GBnews. After the break, we'll look at the Prime Minister's position after last night's rebellion in the House of Commons. But first, it's the weather. It's time to remind ourselves there's always another winter. Canary Islands sponsors the weather. Hello again. Most of the country having a dry day today. There's a little bit of rain here and there, but in the outlook, much of the UK will stay dry into the weekend and perhaps beyond. But it is going to turn colder and increasingly we're going to see fog patches. This weather front is providing some rain today and tomorrow, but this large area of high pressure is moving in and that is why it is turning drier for all of us really from Thursday onwards. Back to today, though, there's some patchy rain from that weather front over Northern Ireland, southwest Scotland, the far northwest of England. Some sunny spells over uh, Yorkshire, down into Lincolnshire, parts of the North Midlands, but generally cloudy across the south. Good spells of sunshine across the north. Just one or two showers around the middle of the day in Shetland. Temperatures above average as well. Another mild day, especially in the south, 13. A 14 is just about possible. We'll keep some outbreaks of rain, though, going across southwest Scotland, the north of Northern Ireland, into this evening. That rain just trickling northwards as we go through the night, so becoming dry across northwest England. Maybe the odd spot of rain over the mountains in North Wales, but generally a dry night. Where skies are clearest across parts of northeast England, pockets of frost possible. Certainly some fog is likely in this area, parts of East Yorkshire, North Yorkshire, down into Lincolnshire. And if we do see some fog, it could last for most of Thursday. Generally, though, it's just going to be a cloudy but dry day. Some rain in the far north of Scotland, certainly initially, but even here, that's pushing away to the north as the breeze picks up. Uh, eastern parts, so northeast England, eastern Scotland, seeing the best of any sunny spells, as long as that fog does clear. And again, temperatures perhaps not quite as high as today, but still on the mild side for the time of year. Not a great deal of change during Thursday. The high pressure is moving in, so a lot of dry weather. Where we see breaks in the cloud, we could see some pockets of frost and, again, some fog patches forming. And that's going to be the issue of the next few days and into the weekend. A lot of dry weather, a lot of cloud, but there will be some fog. And where that fog sticks, well, it really will feel pretty cold. Canary Islands sponsors the weather. You're watching GB News live across the UK and the world on our digital stream. GB News is Britain's news channel. We are the UK's home of discussion and debate from all perspectives. We are here for you. Don't forget to join our YouTube community by clicking on that subscribe button. And if you want the GB News app, you can click and catch up on programmes anytime. We love to hear from you, so email us. GBviews at GBnews.uk Thanks for being part of the GB News family. My name is Andrew Doyle. Join me every Sunday evening at 7 p.m. for Free Speech Nation. This is a show where we address current affairs and news stories of the week with the help of two wonderful comedian panelists. I brought in comics because I want to give it a lighter edge and also they work for less. See you there. Join my show, Farage, 7pm till 8pm, Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate. And I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilised conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. I'm Colin Brazier. I've reported from more than 70 countries around the world, covered wars from Afghanistan to Iraq, from Lebanon to the Balkans. I'm trying to bring that experience, that feel for events, to the studio. And something else, I'm ready to give an opinion. Today's stories with a spark. Brazier from 8 p.m. weekdays on GB News. Join us for the political correction. We're here every Sunday to correct politics and put you, the people, back in charge. We talk about all areas of the United Kingdom, including Northern Ireland. 
Our debate goes way beyond the Westminster Village. It's about the real country. It's about your opinion. So please, we want you to tell us what you think. This is The Political Correction. Every Sunday morning from 10 a.m. here on GB News. You're watching GB News Live across the UK, the world and our digital stream. GB News is Britain's news channel. We are the UK's home of discussion and debate from all perspectives. We're here for you. Don't forget to join our community by hitting the subscribe button. And download the GB News app so you can click and catch up on programmes anytime. We love to hear from you. Email us at gbviews at gbnews.uk. Thanks for being part of the GB News family. Welcome back. We're with increasing pressure on Boris Johnson. There's a huge day for the Conservatives tomorrow. People in North Shropshire will head to the polls to pick their next MP. The by-election was triggered by the departure, of course, of Conservative MP Owen Paterson, who resigned in November after he was embroiled in a lobbying scandal. Been the MP there for 24 years. But is this ultra-safe Conservative seat now about to change hands? Bavinder Sidhu has been speaking to people in North Shropshire. People in Oswestry in North Shropshire are getting ready for Christmas, but before that they have to choose their next MP. This by-election has been triggered by the resignation of Owen Paterson, who broke the parliamentary rules on paid lobbying. He's been the MP here for 24 years. This seat in North Shropshire has been held by the Conservatives for nearly 200 years. It's considered an ultra-safe seat. In the last general election, Owen Paterson safely won with 63% of the vote. But will the Tory sleaze row and that alleged Christmas party change people's voting habits here? Based on, uh, obviously, what's gone on in the last few weeks and, uh, you know, Boris's uh, uh, behaviour over the last few days, and we won't be voting Tory anymore now. We're going to change our mind now. Uh, I know there's a really good female candidate standing um, and I would never, never necessarily have looked at that party. However, I do think that um, her values and what she's standing for are fantastic. I always vote uh, Tory. Yeah, so was, well, you've got to stick by them thick and thin. I don't believe in kicking anyone when they're down. I've had a few people in saying that they will not be voting Conservative this time, which I find interesting. We'll see whether that comes up in the numbers and whether it's a big enough swing for it to go Lib Dem or Green. North Shropshire is a large rural constituency lying on the Welsh border. It's made up of five market towns, Wem, Whitchurch, Oswestry, Ellesmere and Market Drayton. At a Hustings event in Whitchurch, people shared the issues they want their next MP to prioritise. We lost our ambulance station some years ago, and then Market Drayton, which is about 25 minutes away, lost theirs more recently. So we have no facilities for the ambulances to get to us quickly. A total change of the, the mainline parties, because every one of them's let us down. They've, uh, they've locked us down for two years. My own beef is with Boris Johnson. I think most of what he's done is a shambles. We have got one, one doctor's surgery uh, to cater for nearly 10,000 people. Our own surgery closed in March and was never, never reopened. Standing for the Tories is Dr Neil Shastri Hurst, a former military doctor, now a barrister and a new dad. I think I bring my experience having worked on the front line of the NHS, having worked in the military um, and more recently having worked as a barrister to advocate effectively on behalf of people here in North Shropshire. There's been a lot of mudslinging, political mudslinging in this campaign but actually I'm the only candidate who's put forward clear positive plan for North Shropshire. Um, and, and finally, um, I've absolutely committed, cast iron guarantee, this is where we're going to live as a family, this is where I'm going to raise my now seven week old son. Ben Wood was born and raised in North Shropshire and says he wants to bring decency back to politics. I am fighting in this election for the future of North Shropshire, for our public services and for new opportunities in the area. And that's exactly what I'm doing between now and polling day. People are saying to me it's they want a sense of decency back in their politics. And it's got to start at a local level, but you know what, it goes right up to the Prime Minister as well. And that's what we're trying to start here, bring back a sense of decency into our politics. 
But the bookies suggest that the Lib Dems have a real chance of pulling off what would be a huge upset. Now, we have tried to speak to Helen Morgan, but she hasn't been available, so we caught up with senior Liberal Democrat MP Christine Jardine. She is someone who will be out there listening to the community all the time, talking to them all year round, listening to what they have to say about GP waiting times, about the strain that the ambulance service is under at the moment, about the pressures on the farming community. Helen appreciates these things. She will be out there. She will be working for people, people who at the moment feel completely taken for granted by a Conservative government. Standing for the Green Party is Duncan Kerr, who says he wants to improve local services. It's all about bringing the community together, I think. We've been rather neglected for too many years. We've got some fantastic people and some fantastic businesses. We've got great food producers, for instance, but we've not had an MP to really celebrate and bring that together. We need to get the public transport sorted out. The bus service is incredibly poor around here. Voters will go to the polls tomorrow and will find out the result on Friday morning, just before Christmas. Well, let's talk briefly to Baravinda Sidhu, who is live in Oswald Street in North Shropshire this afternoon. Baravinda, ahead of tomorrow's vote, what's the mood like? Well, people here in North Shropshire um, feel very frustrated and forgotten and neglected. They say that they're in a part of the country that hasn't been paid any attention to and they want their next MP to prioritise improving access to local services for them, including ambulance services, uh, access to GP surgeries uh, and public transport. You know, this is a rural uh, community. There's a lot of farmers here who want their issues addressed. But you know what? There's a real mix mixed bag of views here. Some people are telling me they're not going to bother voting tomorrow because they feel so angry and frustrated with what's happening at Westminster. There are others who are saying that they're going to stick to the party they've always voted for. And um, there are some who are saying they're going to switch hands for the first time in years. Um, people are predicting that it's going to be a close race. It will all be about turnout, I guess, Balvinder, if it's going to be close. That's right. I mean, you know, uh, traditionally uh, turnout for by-elections is generally uh, low and here, you know, people are saying that that might be affected by a number of different factors, weather being one, but, the, but it looks like it's going to be a nice clear day tomorrow. But the other is the, uh, the new variant, Omicron. There are concerns that some people might not bother going to vote because they're worried about catching the virus. Um, however, the authorities here have said that, you know, all polling stations are COVID secure uh, and measures are in place to prevent, uh, you know, the virus spreading. Um, but, you know, tr like I said, traditionally, uh, turnout tends to be low, but it is going to affect, you know, it ch that change. Will that change happen is going to depend on people making the effort to vote uh, and how they choose to use their vote. It's a big number that they've got to be. I mean, Owen Patterson in the last general election won by 24,000 votes. Um, so it ha it's a significant change, but they, there is, they are expecting uh, that result to be very close. So all eyes, uh, you know, nationally are on um, North Shropshire at the moment, but not just nationally. Swiss TV are here and there was a guy from the German newspapers here last week. So there's a lot of interest outside of um, the UK. UK on what's happening here and of course there are there are 14 candidates so the you know the choice is quite large as, as to who people can vote for. Alvinda Sidhu, GB News West Midlands reporter in Oswestry there in North Shropshire. Well let's show you a full list of all 14 candidates and the parties they're running for. They are Andrea Allen, Boris Bean Bunged, Martin Daubney and Russell Dean. Also James Alexander Elliott, Howling Lord Hope. Earl Jesse and Yolanda Kenwood. Then there's Duncan Kerr, Helen Morgan, Neil Shastri Hurst, and Susie Akers Smith. And finally, Kirsty Walmsley and Ben Wood. After the break, it's all about your opinion. Today we're asking should the rest of the UK follow Scotland's COVID restrictions? Join the debate next on the Piero and Halligan after the news headlines with Tamsin Roberts.
Gloria, thank you. The Prime Minister has defended last night's vote on Covid measures brought before Parliament, saying it was one with Conservative support. A hundred Tory MPs voted against the government's plans for Covid passes. However, the legislation still passed with support from Labour. The woman who killed 16-month-old star Hobson will be sentenced imminently. 28-year-old Savannah Brockhill was branded pure evil by Star's family after she was found guilty of murdering the toddler. Star endured months of assaults and psychological harm before suffering catastrophic injuries in her home in West Yorkshire. Her mother and Brockhill's former partner, 20-year-old Frankie Smith, was cleared of murder but convicted of causing or allowing the youngster's death. One person has died and a number of others are unaccounted for after a fire at a property in Reading last night. A 31-year-old man has been arrested on suspicion of murder and arson. Police and fire crews were called to a large bla blaze in Groveland's Road. One resident said he had a miracle escape by jumping from the third floor of the burning building. And seven times Formula One world champion Lewis Hamilton has been knighted by the Prince of Wales today for his services to motorsports. It's just days after the British sports star controversially lost out on a record eighth F1 world title. The 36-year-old attended the investiture at Windsor Castle with his mother. I'll have a full update for you on today's main stories at the top of the hour. That's all for now. You're watching GB News live across the UK and the world on our digital stream. GB News is Britain's news channel. We are the UK's home of discussion and debate from all perspectives. We are here for you. Don't forget to join our YouTube community by clicking on that subscribe button. And if you want the GB News app, you can click and catch up on programmes anytime. We love to hear from you, so email us. GBviews at gbnews.uk Thanks for being part of the GB News family. My name is Andrew Doyle. Join me every Sunday evening at 7 p.m. for Free Speech Nation. This is a show where we address current affairs and news stories of the week with the help of two wonderful comedian panelists. I brought in comics because I want to give it a lighter edge and also they work for less. See you there. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate. And I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilised conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. I'm Colin Brazier. I've reported from more than 70 countries around the world, covered wars from Afghanistan to Iraq, from Lebanon to the Balkans. I'm trying to bring that experience, that feel for events, to the studio. And something else, I'm ready to give an opinion. Today's stories with a spark. Brazier from 8 p.m. weekdays on GB News. Welcome back. Today we're debating whether the rest of the UK should follow Scotland's COVID advice. First Minister Nicola Sturgeon has asked people to limit socialising to three households in the run-up to Christmas to try to slow the spread of the Omicron variant. Joining us on the show now is bacteriologist at the University of Aberdeen, Professor Hugh Pennington. Professor, um, it's good to see you on the show again. Uh, welcome. Um, Dr Jenny Harris uh, told MPs this morning that we're seeing probably the most significant threat we've seen since the start of the pandemic. Why are we only talking about Plan B? Um, well, um, we've had a lot of cases in Scotland, despite the regulations being tougher than England. That was with Delta. And Omicron is, uh, is doing quite well, as far as we know. I think all the areas in Scotland that uh, send in data have had at least one case. Most have had more than that, and some have had quite a lot. And, you know, Plan B is uh, not that much different from what was going before. And I think the big problem, the big problem is if you have a lockdown, 
you've got to have business support. You've got to have a furlough system in place that basically keeps the businesses ticking over until, you know, we see exactly what Omicron is going to do, because there are uncertainties about how nasty Omicron is. There's a debate going on at the moment, which is not supported by very much evidence. You know, there's a bit of evidence from South Africa which says maybe it's not as nasty, but of course their population structure is quite different from ours. And there's other countries are saying, well, it may not be any worse, it may not be any better than, than Delta. And at the end of the day, um, well, basically at the end of a couple of weeks, round about Christmas itself or a little bit after, we will have much better data and we'll know really how dangerous Omicron is. I think there's a general consensus view is that even if it is not as nasty as Delta, that means that people will unfortunately be uh, put in intensive care and, and some people will, will die from the virus. Um, I, mean, I don't think there's really any dispute about that. The actual argument is about how big that impact is going to be. And basically, all the things that are being talked about at the moment, either in Scotland or in England, um, really are not going to really stop the virus. They're certainly not going to stop the virus in its tracks. They will just reduce the number of cases because what this virus has shown itself really, really good at is the super spreader events where people go into a clouded room, large numbers of people, particularly when there's heavy breathing going on, singing, shouting, drinking, all that kind of stuff. The virus really has a field day and infects lots of people, even if only one person has got the virus to start with. And even that person might not know they have it because a lot of the cases are, are asymptomatic. The big problem is, if does that virus then get into the uh, high-risk people? And that's people over the age of 60, roughly speaking, people who have uh, problems with their immune systems. And um, even, um, you know, we know now that even pregnancy raises your risk quite substantially. And of course, we know that the booster is going to give you about 70, 75% protection on the basis of the information we have now. But that means, well, 30% of people might well have a very serious infection if they're in one of those high risk groups. So um, it's a very tricky time. It's a very tricky time. Professor Pennington, what would you say to those uh, distinguished scientists like uh, Angus Dugleish, like Professor Shinetra Gupta, who would say that the number of cases isn't important, it's the number of fatalities and hospitalizations, And the evidence is, as it stands, that those fatalities and hospitalizations are remaining very low. In that case, a high number of cases is actually a good thing because that's how you build immunity. Well, yes. Um, that's the old sort of herd immunity argument that we had you know, at the beginning of last year, that let the virus rip. Most of the people are not going to come to any serious harm from it. They'll build up immunity, and then the virus will have nowhere to go. And um, clearly, that, you know, there's, there's, that, that's not an argument entirely without merit. But on the other hand, um, the, the, uh, the question that we really can't give an answer to right now, today, is how many people are going to have a serious I in infection with this virus? Because, I mean, the data from South Africa, they, they have a much younger population there. So they have a very smaller, a, a smaller proportion of people who are in the high risk group because the, the one thing that really determines whether you're going to have a hard time is your age. And my own view, and it's always been there, is that the more virus there is buzzing around, the more likely the virus is to spill over into those high risk groups. And then it all depends really on how strong their immune response is and has been whether they've had the booster and whether that um, booster immunity is going to stop them basically having a serious infection. So, you know, the jury's out on that at the moment. Um, and, and that, of course, creates problems for everybody because people wants to, they want to have an answer now. Uh, what's going to happen? Unfortunately, making predictions about this virus is just as difficult as it was about all the other variants. That it is until you have some data and some data that you can rely on, and basically for the UK, that really means data from the UK. Uh, you can't say this or that is going to happen. It's, it's very much a, um, you know, a, a matter for argument. And I suppose the policy that the government uh, in Westminster has adopted, and also in Scotland as well, is that, well, 
uh, we we can't afford to be cut short by this um, you know uncertainty and in the sense of things are worse than we feared um, or hoped. Um, so let's have a precautionary approach. Let's have some restrictions in, even if those restrictions themselves are not particularly draconian. Let's have those in, and and basically hold the virus off and, until we can see really how nasty it is, and and then we can either relax or continue or maybe even have stronger uh, regulations coming in if the virus is really showing itself to be nastier than we hope. I don't know if scientists um, deal in hunches, but I'll give this one a go. Is it your hunch that we are seeing the beginning of new restrictions or the end of new restrictions? I'm, well, I, I think I would favour basically not the end of restrictions because this virus is doing extremely well. And I think for the next month or so, unfortunately, the virus has appeared just before Christmas, the worst possible time for, 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 for um, any kind of development, not just because of Christmas, because of the weather getting colder. We know that respiratory viruses peak in January. So my guess is that we'll be very lucky to escape without more restrictions. Interesting. Hugh Pennington there, Professor of Bacteriology at the University of Aberdeen. Thanks a lot for joining us here on Gloria and Liam. In England, there are strictures in place, including face mask working from home guidance and COVID passes. But do they go far enough? And would you welcome... The rest of the UK following Scotland's stricter advice. Well, let's look at hospitality in England now. We're delighted to be joined by the landlord at the Royal Oak Pub in Wolverhampton. That's Terry Cole. Terry, are you seeing cancellations? Do you agree with what Professor Hugh Pennington said, that the current restrictions are, quote, hardly draconian? Um... We're not seeing many because we're not. We don't do food in our pub. We're just a mainly a real ale pub, so we get a lot of people coming in. And um, footfall has dropped drastically in the daytime, but over night time, it's quite good. Is Christmas? What do you anticipate? Better than last Christmas, but not as good as a normal Christmas. We're planning for a normal Christmas here. Uh, we start on Friday, which is our week before Christmas, obviously. We've got loads of events going on, which we need. Um, I think people really, really want Christmas this year. I think they need it after the last two years that we've had. Um, I think they're still cautious about it, very cautious. Um, you, do, you do see that, obviously, in the day times, uh, night times. Um, people... people uh, you can see that there's something going on and people actually are feeling that there could be some restrictions put on to hospitality. Um, but we, obviously we're not hearing anything at the moment. Um, so we're just carrying on as normal and just hoping for a good Christmas. Terry, we've lost lots of pubs across the UK during this pandemic. Just try and convey to us how important these two weeks before Christmas are to a pub, particularly a small pub, in terms of building up your cash reserves that can help your business to survive uh, in the quieter months? Well, obviously, we've got January coming up, and that's normally traditionally a quieter month. Everyone pushes dry January, and people start on a health kick, and, you know, and they just want to keep going. Um, for us, if we, we're in a very good position. We're very lucky that we've, been, we've done really well. We've traded really well since April. Uh, we're going to keep going. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, hopefully, if we have a good Christmas, that'll, that'll make up for a bad January. When we had um, the sort of taking the names of everybody that went into pubs, contact tracing, to enable contact tracing, did that have, what sort of effect did that have on your business and trade? Well, we mainly worked outside. We built an area outside and we had that there and uh, everyone had to track and trace. Luckily, we've got a very good community here and they all abided by that. People the rule was that you know, obviously if you didn't sign the book or track and trace, you weren't allowed to drink, and we abided by that. We've been well known for being very safe through the COVID restrictions. And you'll have been keeping an eye on the news, Terry. You'll have heard the First Minister, Nicola Sturgeon, bringing in um, more anti-COVID restrictions for Scotland. Do you think they should also be applying in, in Wolverhampton, across England as a whole? <laughs> 
it's a tough one to ask uh, to answer that really because I mean, if everyone gets their boosters and everybody abides by you know just being very careful, I think we can carry on as we are at the moment. But there is a sense that masks may come back and possibly table service, but that's that's a drastic measure I think for for the industry at the moment. I don't think we need that. Um, but if it has to come in, we'll just have to get on with it and keep doing it and carrying on until they say that we can be free and carry on as a, to trade as normal uh, and carry on. The Prime Minister says that boosters are absolutely key. Um, how easy is it to get one in Wolverhampton? Do, you, do your customers say that they've, they're, they're getting boosted, that it's quite easy to do so? What's your yes, I'm hearing loads of people hearing loads of people saying that they're getting their boosters now. I mean, there's a there's a walking centre in our main shopping centre in town. Uh, there's there's a few uh, vaccination centres in the around, um, and, and they seem to be being boosted. My wife's due to have her soon. She's just she's actually waiting in line at the moment just to uh, to get her booster. My parents have had them. I'm hearing a lot of people taking up the offer um, in our part of the community in the park ward, but. Um, Obviously, I, I can't say for the rest of Wolverhampton, but around here it seems to be quite good. Terry Cole, landlord at the Royal Oak in Wolverhampton. Thanks a lot for joining us here and all the best to you for your business going forward. Some of the people that could be most impacted by new restrictions are care home residents. In previous lockdowns, family members were banned from visiting their loved ones in care homes. Joining us on the show now is the clinical lead at St Cecilia's Care Home, Simon Walls. Simon, have you made any recent changes to your rules and restrictions in light of what we're hearing our politicians say? Well, we've been, the guidelines have changed for us um, in the nursing home in that uh, anybody who leaves the home and goes out, they need to have a lateral flow test every other day. Um, visiting, sadly, has been restricted to three named people. Um, on that. Um, we've had no real guidelines of those people that are on end-of-life care, um, so it's hope that that is open to interpretation because it's obviously it's very important to us that people get to see their loved ones as they're coming to the end of their life, but we're just following guidelines at this minute, but I do expect they may well tighten up. And how do residents and their families feel about the three-person uh, rule? So far, people have been pretty good. Um, to be fair, all the way through COVID, people have understood that we're working on government guidelines rather than in the, what we're doing ourselves. Um, I imagine there's some families that may have more people that need to um, sort of realise who their primary carers are and then work around it like that. But we sort of deal with the people who are the most involved in their care and discuss it with them. Simon, you'll know that some people have called for... Uh, compulsory vaccinations for people who work in care homes and if they don't get vaxxed, maybe the industry can find them jobs elsewhere. What do you think of that as an idea? Well, to be honest, it's, it's already gone through, Liam. It was, it was done um, some time ago um, for social care and then they ended up extending it um, to be in line with the NHS, which I don't understand why they didn't do that in the first place because it's still showing that separation between health and social care um, and um, the people that were here with, that weren't vaccinated have now had to be moved to either other jobs or will end up losing their jobs if they are if they were clinical for instance they couldn't do a job that wasn't frontline or a carer um, so they would end up losing their jobs what so it's, that had, it's a bit sorry pardon me no, it's what, right, um, what, what impact has that had on your staffing levels have you been able to fill those vacancies mm. No, huge, huge impact. It's it's difficult because uh, we talk about retention, we talk about recruitment, um, and unfortunately, at the minute, it's it's a lack of both. Um, we're trying to retain all the staff that we can. Um, obviously, this was an enforced um, people leaving, um, but social care isn't for everybody, such as care isn't for everybody, and we are literally just trying to do our best to try and get through it and hopefully get out the other side. And I'd like to see more people trying to come into social care and provide care for people. So it'd be nice if some one day we were actually fully staffed and we could say, yes, we've got as many people as we need. How's morale, Simon, among the people, the community at your care home there at St Cecilia's? Are 
old people frightened that there's a new variant doing the rounds and that ministers are once again introducing anti-COVID restrictions? Or do they feel relieved, grateful? What's the, what's the range of emotion? Oh, I think we go through all sorts, to be honest. I think there's, there's people who look at it and say, well, actually, you guys are keeping me safe, so I accept anything that you say is good for me or bad for me or what I should and shouldn't do. Um, and people have just been absolutely fantastic like that, and they've all been completely fully understanding, as of the families, in the most part. Uh, there's only very few that have actually caused any issues or raised any issues with us. So, But morale-wise, uh, the staff are hardy. Um, it's a shame because every time we think we see a light at the end of the tunnel, someone keeps switching it off or making it dimmer. Um, but we will keep fighting. We will get through this. And we'll have to get through it together. Uh, you know, in pe people working together outside the home and within the home to get it right for, what, for our residents. Simon Walls, the clinical leader at St Cecilia's Care Home in Scarborough. Thanks for joining us once again here on GB News. It's now time for your thoughts. You've been getting in touch throughout the show about that big question, should the rest of the UK follow Scotland's COVID advice, tighter COVID advice? Victor email gbviews at gbnews.uk to say, surely, if you care about your health, you should have sufficient knowledge to understand how a virus can spread by now so you can make your own mind up of what risks you want to take. Joanne says... I don't want to go down that road of further restrictions straight away. There's not enough evidence. Mark says we can't hide inside all the time. We shouldn't have the same restrictions as Scotland. Marianne says we should be doing all we can to protect each other without having to be told to do so by the government. Alan says no one should follow Sturgeon on anything because her administration has proven to be wrong on so many issues. Not more popular, though, than, than the Prime Minister at the moment, arguably. Um, and Ben says we should only follow Scotland if their restrictions work. Let's wait and see. And that is an interesting point, isn't it? Because yep. they've kept mask wearing right. um, throughout this, but yet they still have... I mean, I do, think, I, restrictions. I, I do think there's a little bit more intolerance and lack of patience among the broad public f towards restrictions, but the polling hugely evidence popular. still shows that <laughs> the majority... in favour. The majority of people are in favour. Um, unlike uh, Boris Johnson's majority, which uh, wouldn't have been enough to get through those, those quite limited, in my view, right. um, restrictions that have come into force today, but they needed the support of Labour and Peace to get them through. You've also been voting, voting in our Twitter poll throughout the show, and 7% of you said, yes, the UK should be following Scotland's COVID advice and limit household mixing, while 93% said... No. So among viewers here, at least, there's a lot of aversion to England adopting Scotland's COVID restrictions. But the Prime Minister is having a press conference yeah. at five o'clock today. And my hunch is that he might well say, limit your social uh, mixing but in the room to Christmas, but, just like Nicholas Sturgeon did yesterday. But they're not going to require it, because if they require it, then they've got to start the furlough scheme up and running again. No, fact, but Nicholas Sturgeon doesn't require it, it's just advice. No, it is just advice. Yeah. That's what, yeah. They won't require it. It will yeah. be advice, it will be suggestions. I don't want to ruin your Christmas, but there'll be lots of pressure to be, for, on businesses to work from home. We'll be covering that press conference live, obviously, on GB News. That's at five o'clock. You've been watching to Pierre and Halligan here on GB News. We're back tomorrow at 2pm. Up next is Dara McCaffrey with The Briefing. But first, it is time for your weather forecast. It's time to remind ourselves there's always another winter. Canary Islands sponsors the weather. Hello again. Most of the country having a dry day today. There's a little bit of rain here and there, but in the outlook, much of the UK will stay dry into the weekend and perhaps beyond. But it is going to turn colder and increasingly we're going to see fog patches. This weather front is providing some rain today and tomorrow, but this large area of high pressure is moving in and that is why it is turning drier for all of us really from Thursday onwards. Back to today, though, there's some patchy rain from that weather front over Northern Ireland, southwest Scotland, the far northwest of England. Some sunny spells over uh, Yorkshire, down into Lincolnshire, parts of the North Midlands, but generally cloudy across the south. Good spells of sunshine across the north. Just one or two showers around the middle of the day in Shetland. Temperatures above average as well. Another mild day, especially in the south, 13. A 14 is just about possible. 
We'll keep some outbreaks of rain, though, going across southwest Scotland, the north of Northern Ireland, into this evening. That rain just trickling northwards as we go through the night, so becoming dry across northwest England. Maybe the odd spot of rain over the mountains in North Wales, but generally a dry night where skies are clearest across parts of northeast England. Pockets of frost possible. Certainly some fog is likely in this area. Parts of East Yorkshire, North Yorkshire, down into Lincolnshire. And if we do see some fog, it could last for most of Thursday. Generally, though, it's just going to be a cloudy but dry day. Some rain in the far north of Scotland, certainly initially. But even here, that's pushing away to the north as the breeze picks up. Uh, eastern parts, so northeast England, eastern Scotland, seeing the best of any sunny spells as long as that fog does clear. And again, temperatures perhaps not quite as high.